Could you tell us uh, something Fine. about your cell theory? Oh no, you have to be a lot more specific than that. <laughs> tell us what was your academic profession? I was a research scientist with Agriculture Canada, the Federal Department of Agriculture in Canada. And I worked at uh, three different institutes, one near Montreal, one at UBC uh, in Vancouver, and then the last one was in Summerland in the Okanagan Valley. Okay, and then uh, you were working with the government regarding... I was working for the government, yes. The, Agriculture Canada, the Department of Agriculture, has a network of research institutes uh, in Canada, mostly in the south of Canada, of course. You know, so, so there's um, one in at UBC, at the University of British Columbia, uh, which was closed in 1996, which is why me and my group we moved to Summerland. There's one in the Okanagan Valley because it was an agricultural. Basically, there were institutes, there were research, uh, research. Um, uh, Facilities. Outfits to help agriculture. So one in the Okanagan Valley, there's one in Agassiz at the other end of the uh, Lower Mainland, uh, and then several in Alberta, several in Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, etc. Et I think there's about 22 of them. And where were you stationed? I was at, uh, at Summerland and UBC and Montreal. Yeah. And you moved from uh, you were originally a plant biologist or? I was a soil biologist working with nematodes. Yeah. And then how did you get uh, in, involved with uh, genetically engineered food? Because, because I was working with nematodes and one I was working with a particular kind of nematodes and they were very, very, they're so tiny, they're microscopic, very, very difficult to identify. And that was 1987, I remember it well, and I had a conversation with somebody from Oregon where he discussed, he suggested that I could use molecular biology to identify the nematode, to look at their DNA, to identify the nematodes, and I thought that was such a bright idea, but I didn't know how to spell molecular biology yet, so I had to learn everything about it, so I went into uh, a lab, uh, one floor below, there were a virology department and they used molecular biology to determine the viruses and so that's where I learned my skills and when I knew molecular biology and working with DNA it became also very quickly apparent that maybe I could use genetic engineering to make resistant, to make plants resistant to nematodes. So that's how we started checking plant DNA? Yeah. But that's not genetic engineering, that's only learning plant DNA. Genetic engineering is basically taking a gene from somewhere and putting it in somewhere else. And were you also studying that or, or involved in actually creating uh, transgenes? I didn't, go very, I didn't go very far because my, my uh, funding dried up oh. in 19... In 2000, in about 2000, 1999, mm -hmm. and then I retired three years Sooner. later. I uh, see. But I was I was involved in it, and I was the head of a department that was doing that. Yes. Very nice, uh, Siri. Now, can you tell us what is what might be of concern to the consumers about the way genetically engineered food is coming on our plate. Is there anything to be concerned about? You know, it's, it's very strange because it, it was when I was working for the government, because I was the head of the department, it was my responsibility to go and talk to people to reassure them that it was okay. There was, it was DNA is not toxic and there was no way that it could be dangerous or, any, or there could be anything wrong with it. And that was in the 1990s. And, and up to 2002 when I retired. 2002 was the year when the human genome was completed, mm -hmm. the human genome project was completed. And uh, we learned that a gene in the genome can make more than one protein. And that's very important. The human genome project 
uh, determined that we have in the human genome uh, just under 25,000 genes that became very clear but everybody expected 100,000 genes ah. because we have about 100,000 proteins in the human body mm. so how could that be? we don't have 100,000 genes, we only have 25,000 genes to make 100,000 proteins it's very obvious that every gene or almost every gene is can more? make many proteins is doing more than one thing oh, it's very okay. clear and is it also possible that many genes are combining to do some things obviously obviously lots of genes are required to do lots of proteins are required to do something the proteins are the molecules in the cell that do the work because lipids and carbohydrates cannot move they can't do anything but the proteins can move. The proteins, because they move, create movement in the cell. They do the work. They do everything in the, in the cell. The proteins are the enzymes. The proteins are what make life possible. So, so when you say that a single gene sequence is likely involved in doing more than, creating more than one protein, involved in more than one activity so then so then when you alter it by by genetic engineering you bring something else from some what what is likely to be the we don't know what we know is that when you engineer a plant you create many proteins that are not expected and that's very well documented there's many uh, research studies that have shown that the proteins, the protein that you expect is either not there or else it has been truncated, it has been altered, it has been changed, it has been mutated and then there's more than one protein. The, the genetic engineering is based on a very naive understanding of, of, of genetics it's based on the one gene, one protein hypothesis. When we discovered DNA in the late 1940s and early 50s, Watson and Crick and, and other researchers would de determine the structure of DNA and, and studied it, it became, it became a dogma that a gene made one protein. And that's what we've been functioning with ever since for the last 60 years the dogma, the paradigm is one gene makes one protein and in 2002 when the Human Genome Project was completed it was very obvious that that dogma is not valid the paradigm that we're basing genetic engineering on is, is, is wrong it's a misunderstanding the new science, the new paradigm is one gene makes a lot more than one protein when you insert a gene from a bacteria into a plant cell, into the genome of a plant cell, you have no control where it goes. It's random. Oh. And that gene that goes anywhere in the genome is now under regulation of the whole genome. And there is lots of regulatory sequences in the genome we used to call them junk DNA. Yes. DNA is that you don't know what is one doing. to two percent of coding of genes and ninety eight percent of DNA sequences we have no idea what they're for. When I was in when I was working, when I was in school, it was junk DNA. Mm. And now we understand that this they're is not actually exactly junk. a very complex ecosystem with very complex regulatory mechanisms which we have no understanding of. So when you insert a foreign gene, that anywhere in the genome, maybe in the middle of another gene, well you've killed the other gene first of all, but also the new gene, the bacterial gene that you've inserted, is now under regulatory sequences, under regulatory sequences from the genome that it's in, and we really don't understand what will happen to it. And what obviously happens to it is that it is now um, being altered and making other proteins, 
proteins that either are very different from the original ones or the one that you expect or that are somewhat different. So about proteins, at least non-experts like us seems to seem to correlate protein with something that we need. But is there proteins that are dangerous and we don't we shouldn't have? Is that also possible? Proteins that are toxic or proteins that are somehow mm -hmm. you one one shouldn't many, 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 many proteins are are toxic, dangerous, poison, etc. Absolutely. A lot of the uh, bacterial toxins they are proteins. are proteins. If you're talking of E. coli or you're talking of uh, mad cow disease. Uh, mad cow disease is a prion. It's a protein. It's a rogue protein. Mm -hmm. So yes, it, it's not a bad uh, analogy either. Um, but a lot of the bacterial diseases that we know of, yes, the toxins are proteins. Absolutely. A lot of the uh, venoms from snakes, a lot of a lot of toxic proteins from from scorpions mm -hmm. are, are proteins. Yes, of course, proteins can be very toxic. And that brings us to the end of this video clip, Siri Rain Part Four. Please wait for Part Five and further. The story is not over yet. So for today, it's over and out from. Tony Mitra.